Hello everybody and welcome back to VU Divulged. I'm Anthony Polkowski, the General Manager, and on today's Distinguished Speaker Series, we have Sharon Renfro and our canine companion Remington of Paw Print Ministries. During her presentation, she talks about the role of an emotional support animal and how emotional support animals are different than service animals. I hope you enjoy her presentation. So I am Sharon. I am actually a first grade teacher in my day job. Remington is part of Paw Print Ministries. Uh, we are a comfort dog organization out of Central Illinois. We have about 43 trained handler teams that work in our community. We have dogs in Texas and on the East Coast as well. And we work around Central Illinois, so Peoria, Springfield, Champaign, Decatur, um, and some in Southern Illinois as well. So we are... Actually, I am just going to start with Remy. Remy Six, I said that to you guys a little bit ago. He is the second of three dogs that I have trained in this program, and I have been training dogs for about 30 years. So this program, when I came into it, I already had background knowledge in training and handling of dogs. My first dog in the program passed away, and I had the opportunity to get Remington from a program that breeds service dogs. Two of our other dogs in our program came from their breeding program, and we were given the opportunity to adopt from them and so we went at eight weeks old and got Remington and brought him from North Carolina to Decatur and he went straight into training at that point. And so he has not known any other life but this. Our dogs are loved, they are part of our families, but they are first and foremost working dogs in our program. This is what they are trained to do, this is what they do every day. So he is at school with me every day in my first grade classroom and he pretty much does this. This is what his really hard life <laughs> consists of. We always say our dogs, their job is to make people smile. That's the easiest explanation of what a comfort dog is for. He loves treats, hates getting wet, and really likes to nap at my feet. Our program was started 10 years ago. This is actually our 10 year anniversary. Um, Jennifer Dawn is our founder, and she was trained through, her, through Lutheran Charities uh, for disaster response. And she did that for several years. Over the course of that time, she met comfort dogs while they were working. Um, dogs that were there specifically to work with first responders, but dogs also who could go into the shelters after disasters and work with the children and the families that were impacted. And during that time, she realized that there's a real need for that. There are not a lot of dogs that are well-trained to do that job. Oftentimes, with comfort dogs, people have a pet that's really sweet, really compliant, and they can be certified pretty easily through some organizations to do that, to simply go and be a happy presence that makes people feel better. Because there's just something about a dog that makes everybody smile, right? Everybody who came and petted him, there was a smile on your face. And that's fantastic. That's what they're for. Our program, though, the decision was made at the very beginning that that wasn't good enough. Our dogs need to be able for us to be facility dogs, which means that we work in a courthouse. We work with forensic interviewing of children. We go into court with children who are testifying. We're present at um, recovery of bodies. We're present after disasters. We're present in schools after there's been a tragedy. So our dogs, when we tell them to do something, have to do it, and they have to do it immediately. So our program was founded on the principle that our dogs not only needed to be able to work and make people smile, but they needed to be obedient while they were doing it. So they are dogs, right? Sometimes they do things that dogs do, and that's just part of handling them and knowing how to recover from that if they do something, and knowing the tools that we use to help them be successful in their jobs. So everybody asks frequently what a comfort dog is. This is just a really quick um, graphic. Therapy dog, comfort dog, interchangeable words. They are legally not allowed to be in a space in public unless they're invited. So we can go to a school, we can go to a university, but we have to be invited there. We do not have protection under the ADA, which is the American with Disability Act, because they are not service dogs. They are also not emotional support animals. Emotional support animals are trained to work with one person to, su to support their mental health. That is not what a comfort dog does. A comfort dog is trained to work with me in a situation where people need that support. So those are those key differences between what we are and what a service dog and an emotional support dog is. In the community, we do lots of really fun visits. We go visit schools when it's reading hour. We go and visit community events like at the library and all of those really fun things. Nursing homes, veteran centers. Um, we also work, we have a dog that's a facility dog in a dental hospital, a dental office. Um, we work also the hard things. We work when there's been a tragedy, when there's been a disaster. So 
that's kind of our list of the things, and we will go into those a little bit more in detail here in a minute. So in the year of 2023, we have 43 dogs working. We did 1,248 trainings and events. We had 9,618 volunteer hours. We are volunteers. Our board of directors are volunteers as well. Everybody does a regular job during the day, and then we do this in our free time. So we are a nonprofit organization run by volunteers. We track all of those hours for grants and funding purposes through any of that process. And so our contacts, 46,430 in the last year. So there are lots of organizations similar to ours. I kind of touched on that in the beginning. Um, those are some of the national ones, the different certifications that can be held. Um, there is in Indiana a really cool, we're social media friends. <laughs> the dogs are with someone who uh, was an assistant coroner, I believe. Um, but their dog just recently retired and is no longer working in that office. I think they've moved on to a different office. And then we have in our community one other dog that works with a different organization. And he is part of the Peacemaker Project. Um, Chris Oberheim is an officer who was killed in the line of duty in our community. And part of that Peacemaker Project is they brought a dog that was trained in Florida at a service dog organization in to do the same thing our dogs do, just in a different organization, a different capacity. So in our program, I touched on that a little bit, that for us, it was very important that when our dogs go someplace that people consistently give feedback that our dogs are well-behaved. Ideally, our dogs should just sort of fade into the background unless you're the person that needs their assistance. So we focus on very, very high impact training. It takes about 18 to 24 months for a dog to complete the program. To be invited to join that training, handlers and dogs are screened and temperament tested. A um, little bit of both for both. <laughs> we, our joke always is, is that we're temperament testing the human just as much as we are the dog. We're looking for a dog who is eager to work, a dog who is friendly, a dog who isn't phased if we throw a pan on the floor and it makes a lot of noise. They're going to look at it and then they're going to turn back to their handler. Um, they can't run. They can't go towards it. They've got to kind of just be in the middle, be willing to ignore it. Um, we are looking for handlers who are calm even when they're in a situation that is stressful. Because if the handler is stressed out, they're not going to be able to do any good for the people that we're serving. We have three phases in our training. Each one has a list of defined tasks that the dogs have to do. Um, they get progressively harder. The beginning tasks are things as simple as when we ask the dog to sit, the dog stays in a sit until we tell them otherwise. And that's under distraction and under stress. So we might have a dog that stays in that phase of training for seven or eight months before they're ready to move on. And that often looks like a group of dogs will be put in a sit or a down, their handlers will leave the room, and then our trainers will come through and they will throw tennis balls or they will drop pans behind them or they will run a rolling cart past them. All of those things prepare them for what we encounter when we're out in the real world working. Not every dog completes it, and that's okay. Some of our dogs never get past to the final stages of training and certification. Doesn't mean that they're booted out, it just means they continue working. Some of those dogs who are at the secondary level of training are allowed to go out into the community with a mentor team. So we have a lot of mentor teams that work under us and they're able to go as long as I am there and Remy is there to sort of guide them through any obstacles they get in and also because I can say, it's time for your dog to go. Um, we just, it protects them, it protects the people that we work with. We are expected to continue training even after they're certified. So Remy got certified at 18 months old. He made it through the program in 18 months, but we still at six years old continue training. We're expected to um, attend a certain number of trainings every month, and we're expected to work at a certain number of events, of events every month as well. Some of our dogs hold double certification in some of the other, um, like Alliance of Therapy Dogs, things like that, those international therapy dog organizations. And it's just another certification. Some of that has to do with insurance because our dogs are insured against any damage that they might cause when we're on a visit. And so ATD holds insurance on our dogs. We pay a fee through them. And so a lot of our dogs are double certified. So the training, the why. We put our dogs in intentionally stressful situations for them to learn two things. One, they need to learn that it's okay, the world isn't ending because something scary happened, but also because they need to learn that their default reaction should be, if I don't know what just happened, I'm gonna look at my handler because my handler's gonna make it fine. 
So we will, you kind of see in our pictures, I've got two couple slides of pictures of them. They're on picnic tables, they're on swings that move, they're in a helicopter, they're, they're in strange costumes, which although they also make really cute photos to make people laugh, they, those experiences are valuable because it teaches the dogs that it's okay if it's weird. We also, through that training process, are looking for dogs that can regain their composure when we do something that makes them uncomfortable. Um, the dog in the pink tutu is my third dog. I said that he's my second of three. That is Charlie, his sister. She also lives with us. She came in actually as a rescue during COVID and never left. She was supposed to get some training and move on to a different home and that did not happen. So reasons that we train for the weird. That bottom right hand picture is actually I think on a third floor at a mental health facility. And we were visiting and all of a sudden there was a human outside the window because he was cleaning the windows. We had a team with us that was not fully certified. Their dog had to leave that visit because it scared him to death because there was a human where there should not have been a human. <laughs> Remy was like, oh, hi, a human. Would you like to say hello to me? Because we've done enough strange things to him in training that it was okay and he figured his life out. Um, we do put them in on boats, on the water, on moving docks. Um, we do a lot of training with a theater group in our area because we will be at children's events, like at children's hospitals, and you never know when fuzzy characters are going to show up, and that can be very unnerving for a dog if they've never seen that before, to have a human-sized stuffed animal approaching them. Dogs can be in paw print ministries that are behaviorally appropriate. It doesn't matter what breed they are. It doesn't really matter what age they start our program. We don't have a cutoff. The younger the dog is though, the easier it is for them to acclimate to what we're asking them to do. Their training, their life looks very different from a normal pet. There are some things that our dogs are never allowed to do. Our dogs are never allowed to play tug. Our dogs are never allowed to rough house. So the people in our homes also get corrected for that behavior sometimes because what happens is um, a dog who is going to be a detection dog, right? Who's going to be an apprehension dog. Those dogs, you want prey drive. You want work drive. Those dogs, you're going to play tug with as a reward. These dogs, we don't want prey drive. I want working drive from him, but I don't want prey drive from him. I need him to do this and be willing to lay like this in 99% of the circumstances where he works. So if his training or his life involves competitive games like tug and he has a prey drive, and we're at a shelter, and there's a little kid with a toy swinging it around, what's my dog gonna do? He's gonna grab it, right? He can't, because he's gonna hurt somebody or scare somebody. So he has to understand that this is what his normal should look like. It does not mean he doesn't get to have fun. It does not mean he doesn't have a good life. There's just rules about what he's allowed to do. And it's why some dogs never make it through our program, because for some people, that's not something their life can support. Their lifestyle just doesn't support that sort of work. And that's okay. So we, like I said, we screen our handlers, we screen our dogs. We do um, a lot of in-depth interviewing with them, asking questions about what their background is. We have a lot of handlers who are teachers, counselors, social workers, um, first responders, several of them in our organization. And so we're looking for people who already have those background checks. We know they're gonna pass them, right? We know that they're gonna be somebody who's safe to go in and work with children and work in and with at-risk populations. And so that is a lot of our process. We, do, we are background checked, um, fingerprinted, we're on file with the county. And then the dogs, of course, have to be reliable. We have to know they're not gonna do anything that would accidentally hurt somebody. So he is a facility dog, which means that he works in a facility. We have dogs that are facility dogs at nursing care. We have dogs that are facility dogs at school. We are working on a facility dog program with our local court system. Um, that right now looks like we bring in dogs and we are only there when they ask us to be. Ultimately, the goal in our county is that there would be a dog full time in the courthouse. Um, that is something that is becoming more and more prominent. And I think my next slide, oh, no, actually school pictures. So when he is at school, does a lot of sleeping, does a lot of hanging out. Um, the picture in the far right hand corner, one of the things that Remy does in our building because of what my specialty is at school, he helps with elopement. Elopement is when kids wanna go for a 
jaunt alone away from all the adults that are responsible for them. And he wears a handle on his vest, and that handle is a really great tool because when I have a young friend that would like to not stay where I am at, I can send Remy with them, and I can ask them to grab Remy and bring them back to me. And so that goes a long way towards making sure that instead of escalating the situation by chasing a child, I'm giving them a task that brings them back to me without confrontation. And it works really well with little ones and it works really well with big ones. I teach in a building that's K through eight. And so even the eighth graders are willing sometimes to do things for Remy that they would not do for an adult that they are upset with. <laughs> So nursing homes, hospitals, veteran centers, um, all the things that you would expect to see there, right? Individuals who are in wheelchairs, who are uh, using medical equipment, things like that. Um, end of life visits are very common for us. So a facility can reach out or a family can reach out and ask us to do end of life visits. And that is something that we get training on how to deal with and how um, we can support a family that's going through that. And of course, we're also there to see medical staff because we all know that nurses and doctors and caregivers are under just as much strain as the patients that are there and the families that are there. So the lady on the bottom left is nonverbal. She does not talk with the exception of she will talk to Remington. Um, the, actually, the first time that she did it, the staff was amazed because they hadn't heard her talk in months and she had a full-on conversation with him. She was telling him jokes. So she is one of our favorite people to visit, but the dogs make a difference um, in a lot of situations. But in nursing homes especially, there are people who remember their dog, and they might not call my dog by his name. They might call my dog by their dog's name, but they talk, and they have those memories and that enjoyment from interacting with him. And mostly, they interact with the dogs, not with us a lot of times. Sometimes they'll talk with us, but usually they just want to pet the dog and talk them, dogs, which is fine. Comfort dogs in the court system. I said that our goal is to have a facility dog in that courtroom. This is Judge Little. He is retired now. But in uh, 2019, he attended a conference, and comfort dogs were just sort of becoming a thing that we were exploring here in the United States. They've been in Europe for a lot longer than we have acknowledged them as an asset here. Um, Judge Little was at a conference where there were several dogs that, from California that were already actively working in court, and he was super impressed by them. He was impressed by their training, their ability to just lay and be present in a meeting, although sometimes we lay in really inconvenient spots. Um, so he came back, and he knew our organization existed. I was a volunteer with CASA, which is Court Appointed Advocacy for Children, and I was already familiar with him because of that work. He presides over our family court and drug court both. When he came back, we sort of started discussing what that might look like in our county. And in 2021, the Bar Association here finally said that it was something they would support. Um, they issued a statement. Uh, urging districts to participate in programs like this one. Um, they, the second paragraph is their statement. Basically, they are legally neutral companions. And that research shows that although some people would think that they might bias a jury, that is not the case. Because they really don't see the dog. The dog is usually at the feet of the person testifying. And in most cases with kids, at least in our county, um, they're interviewed outside of the courtroom on video, right? Like you, they're not looking at the people, their voice is being heard. And so the dog can lay at their feet and nobody ever knows the dog is there. So our state's attorney has a partnership with us and we bring dogs in and out. Um, typically the way it works is a family will be asked if they have a preference for a small dog or a big dog. We sort of assess a little bit, do they have any fears? We do have a German Shepherd that works a lot at the courthouse for some families. That dog is a little bit scary. And so instead the, that handler might come and trade out and take Remington or take one of our other Goldens or our Poodles, things like that. So we try and be sensitive to the needs of the family and the witness that's being interviewed. So we, like I said earlier, we work with forensic interviewers. Um, oftentimes that looks like us being outside of the interview room. And when they are done with the interview, they get time with the dog. Um, that took time in our community for that to be something that was okay. And we had to go through some pretty extensive training because anytime you're involved in that, you potentially could be called as a witness. And there are things that you can and cannot say or do when, there's, when children are being forensically interviewed. So. Um, behavior health program in our community, the same thing. We partner with them. We come into their 
living facilities, we go into their group homes, we go to counseling groups, counseling sessions. Um, the domestic violence shelter that's in our community, we are present during their group therapy sessions and we can be requested at their one-on-one -on -one therapy sessions. Um, we can be requested when a new family is processing into that program. So like if they have, if there's children for instance, and maybe mom needs to be able to fill out paperwork and talk to the counselors, we might be put in a room with the kids. Again, we're all background checked and trained through their organization, and so then we become a safe adult that can stay with that child and distract them a little bit while the grown-up is doing what they need to take care of. Remy's part of PASA. Um, we do a lot of events where it is specifically for children in care, and so camps, um, weekend events, that sort of thing, and we, the dogs participate in those and are there um, present in counseling sessions, present just for fun, right? Because some of those kids have never met a dog that's actually friendly and they're afraid of dogs. And so this goes a long way towards helping them learn some of those skills that come along with understanding that animals can be fun. So disasters, I talked about that a little bit, that the dogs can be either at the shelter where people are at afterwards. Most commonly though, we are there for first responders. Um, we're gonna be, wherever their break area is, wherever it's safe for our dogs to be. And that depends on what has happened and it depends on whoever's in charge at that situation. Some of the people that we work alongside really want the dogs in a very central location to where their staff is working. Some of them prefer that we be stationed at a church farther out where people can come to us if they want us. And it is just, we do whatever the person in charge of that disaster asks of us. And so a lot of our job is just to wait and be told where to go. We're one of the moving pieces when there's response teams. Tragedy deployments for us are anytime there is a death at a school, um, a death of an important community figure. Um, we, we are sent when there are retrievals um, after a drowning, things like that. We're sent to be with wherever the chaplain is at is usually where we are in these situations. We are part of the crisis flight team in Macon County, and that is a team that is organized through Macon Pyatt Special Education. And they put that team together post COVID to sort of organize how schools respond when there's been a tragedy. So before COVID in our communities, when something would happen, the school would handle it by itself. And you might see them reach out to a local pastor or maybe they might call the school in the next town and say, hey, we could really use another set of hands. This crisis flight team has counselors, pastors, social workers, our teams, uh, teachers, psychologists, all sorts of people that are there and a resource that's ready. And so we have a Zoom prior to being deployed where we're given basic background on what has happened and they produce a statement that teachers can give to their students. So we help the teachers. How do you tell a six-year-old that their classmate has passed away, right? That's not something you deal with every day as a teacher. So they give age-appropriate scripts, essentially, to teachers. And then we are sent in to the building, and we are with the counselors. So the chaplains and the counselors and the dogs are usually stationed in what we call a safe room. And so when a child is upset at school, then they will send them to us. And typically the dogs sit with the child. We as handlers don't talk with the child other than just, oh my gosh, I'm so glad to see you. Would you like to pet Remington? This is my dog. We fill it with a little bit of nonsense talk that gets their mind off of it. When that child is calmed down enough to be having a conversation with me, then I tag in a counselor or a chaplain and then they do their job and I fade into the background. My dog stays where he is. Um, busy hands usually make loose lips. And so if they're petting the dog and they're occupied, they are more willing to talk about what's wrong and process through it. And that goes from the tiniest little kids to the oldest football players on the high school football team. Um, last summer, we had a very bad car accident in a town near us and several of the football players uh, did not survive the accident. The ones who did were airlifted out. Um, so we were immediately deployed out through this program. We were at the school. They opened the school that afternoon for people to come. 
we attended the funerals, we attended the visitations. Um, we were, during the visitations, we were split. We had some dogs in the visitation lines with people and we had some dogs with the team and the coaches. And so we also attended the funerals and then we went back. That happened when football season started, so like um, July or August. And then when the first day of school came, we were redeployed. When the first football game came, we were redeployed. So we follow sort of those schools. Along with that, there's business cards over there. The reason we have business cards is because when we go to events, whatever it might be, whether it's fun or whether it's something like the tragedy, we hand them out. Um, those get us. So that card, that social media, I run it. So a background checked handler is at the other end of those messaging systems. If it is a something easy, right, that I can handle like, oh, I'm so glad you checked in with me. If it's more than that and they're needing additional assistance, I can connect them with those services that they need. And so it is an opportunity for us to be able to give them a safe adult to reach out to. It's also really fun. They collect them like baseball cards. Um, even at the nursing homes, they like to hang them up on their walls and see how many of the 42 dogs they can collect. Um, oh, I would like to note that these pictures that you are seeing, they are used with permission from the people who are in them. The exception is, is that these pictures here, um, very few of any of the ones on the tragedy deployment pages are from real events. We do not take pictures of those. If we do, we take them outside like of the school. We might line the dogs up and take one and then say, you know, our organization is thinking about whatever school. These are all from training scenarios. So when we train, we train for these two. And we have tissues and we have cough drops and we have all the things that the dogs might encounter there because we, the last thing we want is for somebody to be crying and wiping their eyes and for my dog to steal a tissue from them, which if he had his way, he would steal their tissue. <laughs> so we train for all of that. These pictures are not from real tragedy appointments. They are from our trainings. First responders, um, anywhere the chaplains are at, whatever the chaplain tells us to do is what we do. So sometimes we accompany them when they need to um, visit with a family after a fire or after an accident. Um, we usually are staged with the chaplain when there's a body recovery after a drowning. Um, and then of course we do the fun stuff too. All the events what first responder families get to attend, we are there as just sort of a fun event and fun connections, especially for their kids. So Remy's second job, um, I do always point out at the very end of my stuff that Remy is with me all day, every day because of his first job. Um, I do have a medical condition uh, that he started alerting to because he is with me all day. And so he reliably alerts to that. He is my service dog as well as a comfort dog. Um, it we did not set out for that to be that, but because of his training and because he is with me so often, he did begin alerting. So he is a seizure alert dog. And so he is a little bit different than some of our other dogs because he is protected under the ADA because he is a service dog. Um, you guys have any questions? I should probably look and see what time it is because I would talk about Remy all day. Do you guys have questions about what we do or about Remy or our training? All right. So then I need some volunteers. Do you have a question? Did you have one? Uh, I was just going to ask, how do you help train them for people with special needs and their anxiety? So through uh, practice. So we have the theater groups that we work with come in and we stage all of that. Um, we also start out when they're very first in the program by simply putting them on the benches that they're on and then giving them distractions, including bumping the benches, moving them. That relates to later in their training when they might encounter someone who moves differently than a typical person because what they learn when they're very new to the program is that even when something is weird, I just stop and I look at my handler, and my handler's gonna tell me how to handle it. So we start with this ingrained in them that the word N-O means freeze. It means freeze and look at my handler. Um, actually, you wanna come up here? Do you mind, are you like dogs? Remy, come, let's go. Hi. So they are, they are not, we do not use hand signals with our dogs. Um, if you wanna stand right there. Um, we don't use hand signals with them for a couple of reasons. One, when we're out, uh, everybody, you know, oh, shake my hand. Oh, come here, puppy. We want them to listen to us. If I were to hand the leash off 
to somebody else. My dog is trained to go with them and listen to their commands. Not every dog in our program can be handed off to a second handler. Um, by the time they get through our complete program, most of them can be though. So if you wanna to pretend to be a really fun individual that we have met in the community who really wants my dog to come to you and call him. Come here, buddy. Come nope. Here. Come Good here. boy. Remy, come. come here. Let's go. So the word no, right? He stopped and he was like, oh, what's mom doing? Sit. Good boy. He probably won't do it a second time. You wanna try? Come here, buddy. Come here. I got a treat. <laughs> you want a treat? Come here. Come here. Make friends. He was like, oh man. So when we use that N-O word, that means stop, look at me, remember what you're supposed to be doing. And until I release him to go say hi, he shouldn't have taken a step forward to him at all, which you saw that I gave him a, a correction, right? Um, the corrections that our dogs get are not intended to be, they're not intended to hurt them. They have really thick fur, right? Uh, it is a reminder that, hey, pay attention to me. That's all it is. They do wear, collars on that are just like a uniform. Their vests, their collars are just like putting on a suit and a tie or any other uniform you would wear to work. It gets them in the mindset that it's time to do the job that I was trained to do. Remy, come. Good boy, thank you. So when we are training them for, because we do work in areas where they might um, need to be carried or might need to be placed up on something to keep them away from dangerous things, so in a disaster area, right? We do train them to wear boots. We do train them to be able to be carried. We train them in case a dog would be injured. We do train them to allow themselves to be restrained and carried. So either on a backboard or on a blanket. Um, that's just part of the strange things we ask them to do. Remy, come. Pause. 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 Good boy. He says that's really hard. So when we go to hospitals, nursing homes, we obviously don't jump onto the beds, but we do put our feet up with permission for people to pet free. And so they will stay where we ask them to stay until we give them either their free command or we give them let's go. And all of our dogs use common language. So that is why we can hand off a leash to a different handler because everything in our program is structured with common language. So all of our dogs respond to the same commands, which sometimes for those of us whose voices those of us who are teachers who have the same intonation to our voice when we're asking a class to listen, occasionally our dogs will hear a command from another handler that has a similar voice and they will do it because they're like, oh, I'm supposed to be doing that. <laughs> Any other questions about training? I feel like I've talked a ton. Yes. So that's a little bit handler dependent. Um, the answer is yes, they can get onto our beds if they're invited up. So we have a very strong system of I give permission first. So he took a step towards him, he got a correction. If he gets up on a bed and I haven't asked him up on the bed, he's gonna get removed from the bed and get a correction for that. Because if I didn't invite him to do it, it just ensures that he's listening and paying attention all of the time. So yes, my dogs are allowed on the bed, but when we ask them to get up there, they sleep on the couch in the living room. They're just like any other dog. If I ask them to get up though, they, they get up, so. Any other? questions about him you guys are welcome to see him he does have business cards here um, he this is the bench that we use oh, dear let's go so when they are puppies they have little tiny benches hop up hop up yes sit oh boy and so halt so i could have done the whole presentation with him up there and he would have stayed there um, He's six and you know, he's not a small dog. So I try not to make him do that. When he was a puppy, it was a lot easier. Remy, come. Good boy, good boy. So this is something, like I said, I'm a volunteer for and I'm super passionate about what we do with the dogs. Um, one of the biggest things for me is that he had to learn as a puppy that when I'm teaching, so our release word is free. But when I say free, it's with that tone of voice. What I learned very quickly though, is when I praise my first graders and tell them, okay, we're done. It's with the same tone of voice that I use for free. So he had to learn to listen for the word, not my voice, not for my intonation. He had to listen for the word. And so he spent some time in training, 
set up on a bench with me talking and me pacing and talking like I would to my students. And our trainer stood near him and every time he started to make a move that showed us he was gonna respond to something that wasn't his release, he was corrected. So he learned to be very observant of what my body and my voice, whether I'm paying attention to him and giving him a command or whether I'm talking to other people. Um, it was just a bad habit that we had developed because I talk with my hands and I talk a lot. And so he had to learn to, to listen to what I was saying. So, And all of our dogs that work in facilities have their own little quirky things that we have to work through too that are unique. Um, so our dental office that has the dog, they had to make sure that he understood some of the, the things that happen in their office that were unique for them, so. The courthouse is a little bit weird for our dogs. We do do trainings in the courthouse because it's marble floors. Marble floors are slippery, marble floors are reflective. So we do take the dogs in there from very young ages so that they can get used to it. Because um, the last thing we want is a dog to panic when they're supposed to be there supporting a, a victim during their testimony, so. And the, bank, the uh, Witness box is really small, so for our big dogs, that can be a challenge. They have to learn how to tuck themselves underneath it. Um, they have to learn how to sit you know, in the benches. We, they're like church pews um, in the courtroom for us, and so they have to learn how to sit underneath those quietly, and if they creak and people move or make noise or somebody gets loud or a bailiff has to remove somebody, our dogs have to have experience with all of that. So we do those things during our trainings so that the first time they see them, isn't when they're in that situation. We do a lot of strange things in our trainings. We always like volunteers for them, though, because we like for people to come and be silly and ask them to do things they shouldn't do. Hi. All right. Yes. So obviously all the dogs are individual and not one size fits all, but on average, when they start the program to being ready to go out, uh, how many hours of training typically are you looking at so 18 months to tw 18 to 24 months and we are training once sometimes twice a week for at least an hour at a time in professional with a professional trainer in class settings outside of those class settings we also are working with our dogs every single day for 10 minutes at a time 10 times a day right so hours and hours and hours you know you add up so he, has, he attends training still every single month, um, at least two usually, um, and then he's working every day. And so when we are working, it can be very easy if you're in a routine every day to let something slip. And so there might be a day where I decide we're gonna really focus on me if I ask you to you know, sit next to me during this particular activity that I'm gonna really focus on that skill and correct it if he doesn't do it, just to tune up anything that's a bad habit. Thank you guys for letting me come talk to you today. Thank you. Can everyone please give another round of applause for